Don't swear gossip. I hear that. <laughs> Leading him 
to start a Sunday morning fellowship um, over there. They already have women's studies and men's studies over there. And so he's looking at uh, and trying to see what the how we're doing it over here so we can kind of do whatever uh, they can do, whatever they, they can do over there for uh, Sunday morning fellowship. So uh, they feel free to ask questions of people. You'll, he asked, he said, so, he said, do you have an order of service? And I went, yeah, song, service, song. <laughs> we keep it simple. I remember when we, when we started this eight, nine years ago, we were just meeting in the card room over at the uh, lake house when I was teaching for the first two years. And Cheryl said, it's not really church unless you've got singing in a program. You know, I said, well, we're not printing out a program. So you know, we'll, we'll see about singing down the road. And uh, Dave asked about music. I said, yeah, we used to have, you know, someone, you know, uh, Mary play the piano. And we had the, uh, uh, you know, folks would join over the piano and say, well, we're, we're doing fine with, we may be getting some live music soon. No pressure, guys. We won't name anybody. We'll just call them Wayne and Mike X. <laughs> All right, Women's Fellowship is this Tuesday at 1 o'clock right here, right? Uh, there is no Wednesday, there's a Wednesday, but there's no Wednesday morning at Lapeed. There is no Thursday uh, study for uh, this Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Um, Bel Air uh, Food Pantry is looking for a used, donated, donated for a used uh, uh, refrigerator for over at Bel Air Food Pantry. They asked us to promote that as well. I know ALC, Adult Life Connection is as well. All right, get ready to boo. <laughs> get warmed up for the boos. Okay, we on Sunday mornings beginning in January when the lake house opens. Yeah, groan. Yeah, we're, we're, getting, we're going back to the lake house, which is going to make potlucks a whole lot easier. Can we do that twice a we can do it, yeah, as much as you want to organize it, that's fine. Yeah, so anyway, but yeah, we, they, this building will not be open. Uh, they would have to bring staff in over here. That building will be staffed, just like it was before. And it, it's, it's, to me, it's perfectly understandable that they, that they ask us to go over there on Sunday mornings. So we'll be there Sunday mornings and Thursday nights uh, when that opens. And I expect that they'll start taking reservations uh, for those rooms on December 1st. And uh, we've never had any competition for Sunday mornings, so uh, that's not that shouldn't be a problem at all. Thursday nights has been most of the time we get our we get our Thursday nights. All right, anything else going on? <laughs> <laughs> Killing the messenger. Oh. All right, I knew that was coming. Is it Yeah, you, you can hate me for really good reasons here in a few more weeks. Uh, oh, gosh. I'm just one voice out of seven. All right. I was reading this morning in, uh, in Matthew, and Jesus heals the two blind men. And, and it says in Matthew 20, 29, And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him, and behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus stopping, and stopping, Jesus called to them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. I think many of us, most of us have seen this before, but I hope you enjoy it. Brothers and sisters, we are always courageous, although we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. While well, we walk by faith, not by sight. Christopher Dudley was born in May of 2001. He's actually the son of my youngest brother and his girlfriend.
And when I received the phone call from my brother, I found out that he was born in only 26 weeks, one pound, 12 ounces. So he was very premature and he was in critical condition. And there were several nights that we were told that Christopher wouldn't make it through the night. And at that point, I prayed for Christopher. And I just asked God to be with my brother and to do what his will would be. And for a long time, I had no contact with my brother. really didn't know what happened to Christopher. And all of a sudden, my heart was moved. Where was my nephew? What happened to him? And on my first phone call to social services, the gentleman knew about Christopher, and he indeed was in foster care. He was totally blind. He had been born with cocaine in his system, and he had a host of other medical issues. My first response to that, or my first feeling to that, was fear. I prayed very intently, and I really, I begged the Lord, I said, could you just show me, show me what you would want? And he did, he answered in my heart. He told me, do not be afraid that I will take care of everything. We've had challenges and we've had joys. And one of the greatest joys was to hear Christopher make noise, sing, and keep beating. He really didn't talk till about first grade. So when he sang, it was really me. And it wasn't shortly around that time that we found out that Christopher had perfect pitch. And he What a joy and what a promise that God gave us that these tears would come and they come out of great joy. And when Christopher sings, open the eyes of my heart, he teaches us to not see everything in our eyes, but to see things the way God sees things through our heart. And indeed, I want to see that today.
Your fault there, Bob. <laughs> so we're back in the lake house, you said January? Yeah. All right, this is a group, uh, you might recognize my son Joey and his wife Meredith in the front. She's about to deliver our second grandchild, grandbaby, in January. Everybody that's behind them, as that's part of the disciples that we're making in the Philadelphia area. They're all millennials in this case. And some of them I know, some of them I don't know. When I'm up there at Christmas time, I'm going to be gathering and retraining some of them. But I highlight it because some of them have formed what we now call second generation groups. So churches multiply. Um, healthy churches multiply. And so we have started these plants, but then when a plant starts another plant, that's called second generation. And our goal is to have four generations, because after four generations, we start to lose contact with the leaders. These are not, Charlotte Wake's not organized to be, a, it's not a Charlotte Wake church. This is the church where we train the leaders, train them to make disciples, train them to make other leaders. And so that was exciting for me to see because many of those in the picture are second generation, haven't met them yet. And then here in Charlotte, this is a part of a group. Uh, this is my Friday night. These are Gen Z. Now, millennials, they're born like 19, what is it, 80 to 1985. <coughs> Gen Z is born. 1995 to 2012. So they're in high school, college, and just entering the workforce. These are the leaders, most of these are high school students, and uh, they're trained here, and then they go out and they start groups. So that is a second generation cluster here, and it's taking place at a schoolyard. The only person I think I know here is this guy who is part of the Friday group that we've trained and he goes out and he finds his friends and um, makes disciples and one thing I want you to notice this group because it's second generation they're not using the translation that the other ones that you gave to us they're, they're using other translations whatever they have but I want you to notice the prevalence of paper Bibles this is the techno generation that, you know, we say does everything on the phone. And I started noticing this and I say, why are you using paper Bibles? Sometimes they're coming with two versions of it. And the answer is they're listening to God. And you can't do that as easily when you just grab a verse on your phone. And so they're flipping back and forth, they're writing notes, and it's just a great encouragement to see. So when I'm up in Pennsylvania, on Christmas time, I'm looking forward to meeting some people I haven't met yet before and um, see what God is doing up there. The reason why at Pennsylvania is we had trained some people in Pennsylvania three years ago um, through some remote training that we did, and then basically it rooted. And um, so last March when I was up there, 
I was actually in a group that never even, many of them never even heard of us, and yet they were using all of our terminology, all of our techniques, and so on and so forth. So it's just exciting to see how, it, how it's been moving. So is Carolina, right. is Carolina Orchards our second generation? Second generation. <laughs> Dave, you from Carolina Orchards? Yeah. Good job. You're doing, they're going to try to model this over there. I, did I talk with you this week? I talked with somebody from Carolina Orchards this week. It was you. Probably my parole officer. <laughs> <laughs> I had somebody call you this week from Carolina Orchards. That, that's you, right? Oh, that's me. So, Dave, you, didn't know, you don't remember that? <laughs> it must have been a very impactful conversation. <laughs> Connect the dots. I'm sorry. I'm old. I would like to shake your hand, though. Obviously, Bob got hold of you. I'm so sorry. Oh, I got hold of you. <laughs> nice to meet you. We had, we had already forbidden him to talk to you or Floyd. <laughs> so, but apparently, that didn't work out even at the beginning. That's, that would be second generation. Carolina works with wants to do what we're doing here. All right, let me make sure I've got everything done. Let's open in prayer, and then we'll be in Acts chapter 8. Father, we are um, grateful to be used by you in your ministry, and it's our heart's desire to be more like Jesus, to love you more, and what we ask is we open your word that you just speak to us, and that we would be more like Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter 8. Why does this never work when it's supposed to work? Because I don't turn it on. Acts chapter 8. Now let me try this again from the beginning. All right, now. I hope that's working. Acts chapter 8. Math Matthew chapter 16. Jesus wants to know um, who people say he is. And Peter gets the answer right. And Jesus says to Peter, Blessed are you, Peter. Flesh and blood has been known to you, my Father who is in heaven. You are Peter. So he changed the name from Simon to Peter, meaning rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not stand against it. You are Peter, and upon my rock, Upon this rock, I will build my church. That's going to become an important point for us as we follow now the establishment of the New Testament church because it's going to happen in three stages. It's going to begin in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. We've talked about that. When primarily the audience is Jewish. It's now going to come upon the Samaritans. The Holy Spirit will come upon them. And then, when Cornelius gets um, saved and then meets Peter, and the Holy Spirit comes upon the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, we'll have phase three of the establishment of the church. It's an important piece to understand to figure out what's going on here. And why does the Holy Spirit appear to be coming again when he already came to Pentecost? So there's your background. It's going to be a three-part invasion of the kingdom of God as a way of putting it. So let me go to pause there. I have been arguing that the church, us, we are a people of a different kingdom. We have a different citizenship. We are born here, but when we come to Jesus, we become citizens of another kingdom. We swap passports. And in that sense, we are members of a kingdom that's already come because we're here, God's spirit is here. But the kingdom is not yet fully come because Jesus isn't coming back yet. And I, before we ever got into Acts, I kept making the point that for the kingdom of God to come, it's the Messiah plus the spirit, kingdom of God has come. So that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he did that before the Holy Spirit came. So when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and established the New Testament church, that wasn't yet the coming of the kingdom of God, which is the big question that the disciples were asking Jesus in that 40 days after he rose from the dead and hung around for 40 days, what was he talking about? He was talking about the kingdom of God. They had a very good question. Is now the time for the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, no, it's not for you to know the days or the hours. 
But you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and uttermost parts of the world. And so there's this already but not yet aspect of the kingdom. We're the already part. And that's central to the book of Acts. But as it turns out, it looks like the Lord formed this New Testament church in three distinct stages. Among the Jews in Jerusalem, among the Samaritans, and then when they let the Italians in the club, all the Gentiles were in. <laughs> we'll see that in a couple more chapters. So in the book of Acts so far, we see the ascension of Jesus. That's why he ascends before the Holy Spirit comes. That's the next part. And then right away we start to see persecution. That's going to be a theme for the next 2,000 years. The persecution begins with the religious leaders. Peter and John heal a lame man, and then they drag him before the Sanhedrin, and more than once they bring the disciples. They say, don't preach in this guy's name anymore. And they say, well, we have to obey God, not you. And then they beat them and send them on the way. And they were rejoicing because they were suffering in the name of the Lord. So we see the persecution come, and then we see the church praying about it. And then as the chapters go, we see that, well, we're saying there's not just problems from the outside, there's problems on the inside. So Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife, who are believers, they sell a piece of property, they're real estate agents. Don't hold that against real estate agents, but they're real estate agents. And I was kidding about that. Do hold you that. You have to be quick. They sell a piece of property that was all under their control before and after, but they chose to lie. And they, some to the apostles, but lied about holding some back. And Peter says first to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? That's a key phrase. Because what we're going to see as the book of Acts goes forward, a greater and greater presence of the opposition coming from the kingdom of darkness or from Satan. When you get to Acts 19, it's a full-blown spiritual attack. When Satan fills their hearts and they lie, Peter says, look, it was all yours before, it's all yours afterwards. Why did you choose to lie to the Holy Spirit? Why did you test the Holy Spirit? And they would have understood that the reference would have been just like their forefathers tested God in the wilderness, so now you're testing the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, is God. And so therefore, Ananias drops dead. His wife comes in hours later. They say, is this what you uh, your husband did? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, oh, why have you done this? And your husband is dead, and... A few of those who buried her husband out the door, and she drops dead too. And all the people said, hey, they're nice people, but we're not hanging around with that group. <laughs> Great fear came upon them because of the holiness of God in the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's an important point. I'm going to hit that over and over and over. What temple? Us. The people that are here ahead of time, but not yet a kingdom? Well, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember the big temple of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, you were there, right? When you were like 10? Never mind. <laughs> Some of you going, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. In a big temple, there was a place where God's presence resided, which was called the Holy of Holies, with a big old curtain in front of it. Only the high priest could enter that, not only once a year. They would tie a, a rope around him and some bells so that if he were to die in the presence of God, they could drag him out because anybody that goes into the presence of God would be killed because he's a holy God. And so with the death of Jesus on the cross and the ripping of that veil, the access to the holy God is now capable through Jesus. We don't die. We're welcomed into his presence. But if the temple has shifted from the building to the people, that temple better be holy. And that's what we learned with Ananias and Sapphira. You tested the Holy Spirit. You died for that. Now, these were things that God was teaching the early church. I'm thinking, look, they lied about a real estate deal. I'm trying to think of all the things I've done in my life, probably on a scale from 1 to you know, 100. I'm well past the lie to the Holy Spirit about making donations. So what was up with that? And I think what the text is showing, what God was showing is this new people is the temple, and you don't mess with God's holiness. So we learn that in Acts chapter 5. And then the opposition starts again. Oh, but they're growing, and so they're grumbling. And it's like, oh, it's like, oh, we feed all these people. There's more than 5,000 at this point. Everybody's grumbling. There's a difference between the Hellenists and the 
Hebrews, they're both Jewish, but one is culturally from New York and the other one's from Atlanta. And they just grumble and with each other. So they pick seven deacons. And these are not typical deacons who take care of the parking lot and nursery. These are deacons who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who serve the tables and the doors. But they had bigger ministries than that. So you see somebody like Stephen, one of the seven, engages the crowd with the wisdom of God. And he gets some people mad and they stone him. And so that's Acts chapter 6 and then into 7. Stephen gives this nice long speech before they stone him. We talked about that last time. But there's another one of the seven whose name is Philip. And we're going to meet him this time. He's Philip the Evangelist. Spoiler alert. He's not the same one as Philip the Disciple. Remember Philip and Andrew? The I call them the truffle hunters because they're always sniffing around for where there's food. So not that Philip, Philip the Evangelist, who's one of the seven, who was a deacon, an evangelist. So these guys were living way on tables and serving on tables. They had very extensive ministries, and that's what we see with Philip. OK, so a little bit ahead of myself. Let's get to what happens in Acts chapter 8. Saul, now remember from last chapter, they were dropping their garments at Saul's feet as they were stoning Stephen. Saul will become Paul in the next chapter. So we're talking about the apostle Paul, but before he got saved. So he's Saul, and he's a coat, a, a coat check guy. Never mind. <laughs> but the fact that it's included in the text the way it is probably implies that he had a lot to do with the stoning of Stephen. He wasn't just happening to be there taking people's coats. And Saul approved of his execution, Stephen's execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. They were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, a couple notes. Persecution makes the church grow. It scatters the church. And martyrdom makes the church grow. These are things that I know the devil must know this, but he must take so much joy out of killing the church that it doesn't seem to stop him. But church, the church has been rooted all around the world through the blood of the martyrs. And so persecution causes people to scatter. All of this is prior to 70 AD. 70 AD is a really important date because that's when the Romans came in, they destroyed the physical temple, they destroyed Jerusalem, they threw the Jews out of the land, and they didn't come back until like 1948. All of this is happening before then, when the church is still primarily Jewish at this point. So to get it to go from Jerusalem to the next sphere beyond that is Judea and Samaria, this persecution. Now, so Judea is where Jerusalem is. That's the province. Then. Samaria is where the ten northern tribes would have been. That's a city called Samaria. We'll see in a second. And it's basically where the northern tribes were, who were taken into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 BC, and then when everybody came back after the Babylonian captivity under the Persians, there was all of a sudden these people there called the Samaritans, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the church from Jerusalem starts to extend to Samaria, and then the more persecution, it's like dropping a rock in a pond, there's these ripples, they just keep extending throughout the Roman Empire. Sooner or later, they're going to get to Antioch, which we will see in future chapters. Antioch becomes then the sending church for all the other missions. So persecution, though nobody wants or welcomes persecution, is always used by the Lord for the expansion and help of this church. Now, what's interesting is it says that the, disciples, the apostles, that would be, the, in this case, the rest of the 12, they didn't scatter. Why is that piece of information there? I don't know. Was it that they were being faithful to the post? Was it that the job in Jerusalem wasn't done? I don't know. Maybe it's to show that you know, they're not in fear. Nobody really knows why. But they're still there. Now, they're going to face persecution. Everybody except for John is going to be martyred. And John gets off by only getting boiled in oil and sent into captivity. Shoot me. <laughs> I think about that. And here's a side note. It's like, you know, we, we wrestle with, well, 
did this really happen? And every year around Christmas time, you notice all the you know, little journals come out with, oh, we found John the Baptist bones. We we're going to find Jesus bones. And someone asked me one time, what happens when they find Jesus bones? I said, well, I'm not going to church on Sunday. I mean, it's that simple. If you find a bone, you're in a lot of trouble. So what happens is the apostles remain at their post. God uses the persecution. The church grows to it. But because it's before 70 AD, the full persecution has not yet come. When that happens, the church goes from being primarily Jewish to primarily Gentile. Paul will write about that in Romans 11 when, God, when Paul says that God gave the gospel to the Gentiles to make Israel enemies. And then the church is scattered throughout the Roman world. Then the Romans start to figure out, wait a second, this church is different than Judaism. And a whole different kind of persecution starts. Throughout this, what ramps up in the book of Acts is the second battlefield, or the third battlefield. The first battlefield is going to be with the religious leaders. The second one is going to be with the uh, Gentile rulers. But the gates of hell start to orchestrate this. And we see hints of this right up front. Why did Satan put this into your heart? And we're going to see more and more of that as we meet Simon in a couple of verses. So devout men buried Stephen. And, uh, oh, by the way, it goes back to, um, yeah, no. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Uh, by the way, uh, they would bury, as um, Orthodox and most Jewish people today, would bury within 24 hours. And now it's you no know, embalming, just do it. So Stephen, um, anyways, okay, so Stephen is buried with great lamentation over him. Paul was ravaging the church, entering the house after house. And he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, we'll see through church history that women become martyrs as well. I think it's intentionally put in the text here. It's like this persecution is going to be severe and it's going to get worse. There's a period of great persecution that is coming and will come in waves and everybody's being affected by it. I think of what just happened in Afghanistan as the Taliban came back in, there have been reports after reports of the murdering of Christians. Some of them have been very graphic reports that I have received, even going house to house uh, to find them and other political enemies. So this is what Paul is guilty of before Jesus finds him in the next chapter. This, this is not a small deal. OK, so now what happens is we're Paul's put there because Luke is going to pick him up in the next chapter where we see his conversion. But let's go back to Samaria now. This is the second phase of the building of this New Testament church. The kingdom of God is being advanced in its formation in three stages. In Jerusalem, Samaria, Gentiles. Jerusalem, Acts 2. Samaria, Acts 8, Gentiles, Acts 10. After that, the attention of the book of Acts is going to shift to its expansion. It's going to change characters from Peter to Paul, and it's going to show the three missionary journeys. But it's formed in three stages, and Peter is the key guy, which we'll see, and that's why I started with Matthew 16. And Peter and Paulus were on building church. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip, that's Philip the Evangelist, he's one of the seven deeds went down to the city of Samaria. The city of Samaria was founded by King Omri, the Israelite king. You find that in 1 Kings 16 and verse 24. And Samaria itself became a competing city. Remember, Israel was divided in half, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. They didn't like each other. They set up separate religion. And when Jesus encountered the woman of the well in John 4, that was a Samaritan woman. Jews and Samaritans didn't like each other. In fact, the Jews would cross over the Jordan River, head north, go back into Galilee, just to avoid Samaria. So the fact that Jesus was talking to a Samaritan woman in John 4 is a big deal. She engages him in a conversation. She says, well, you Jews say you got to worship in Jerusalem, but we say you need to worship here on this mountain, and that mountain would be Mount Gerizim. 
Which do you say? And Jesus affirms that salvation comes from the Jews, but then gets to the heart of the issue, which is her own heart, reveals himself as the Messiah, and she is saved. But she was highlighting some of the differences. So the Samaritans, they were kind of considered themselves Jews, but the Jews did not consider themselves Jews. When the Jews came out of the Babylonian captivity under the Persians, they came back in the land, and who gave them the hard time? Samaritans. Where did these people come from? Well, nobody knows for sure. And scholarship has only recently advanced on the Samaritans with the discovery of some of the Samaritan writings among the Dead Sea Scrolls and the excavations taking place on Mount Gerizim. But it's commonly held um, primarily through Josephus. And the Samaritans are people that wound up being Samaritans because of the captivity of the northern tribes. All right, I'll put a historical pause. I'll try to make this painless for those of you that don't like history. The Assyrians, with an A, not Syria, not Syria, but Assyrians, were the mean, nasty terrorists of the 8th century. They were the first people to impale people on stakes, flay them alive, let them scream to terrorize their enemies, if you were a junior high audience, you would be riveted right now. <laughs> These are the Assyrians, mean, nasty, ugly people. They conquered the northern tribes of Israel and pulled them kept in captivity in 722 BC. When they did that, their model of domination included taking people out of the land and then going to other parts of the land and bringing people in to intermarry. And in that way, you break down tribalism and all that stuff that as Americans we don't normally talk about, like the Afghanistan, for example, everything is by tribe, everything is by people. So how do you conquer that? You intermarry them with really good-looking girls from another part of the empire. And that was, I'm sorry to put it that way, but that was their thinking. Have families, you become different people. Well, this other people, it seems, became Samaritans. Again, the scholarship is good, but it makes sense in some levels. So they inherited this Jewish faith. In fact, the Samaritan Pentateuch is still in existence. It was a really important tool for biblical scholarship. They held in the five books of Moses, but the Jews never really brought them into the family, so to speak. And they always seemed to be on the side of the Hellenists or the, uh, the Syrian kings that would be beating up on the Jews and everybody else just before Jesus was. There was always seemed to be on the wrong side. The way I put it is there was a pecking order in Israel, and at the top of the pecking order was the Jewish male, followed by uh, Jewish women and children, followed by the family dog, followed by the Gentiles, and then followed by the Samaritans. Yeah. So Samaritans were not well loved, not well liked, and so who would let them into the charge? you got to be kidding me. Led them into the church. So Philip went down and proclaimed to them the Christ. He talked to them about Jesus. And when it says talk to them about the Christ, the Messiah, that means the gospel, the good news, that we have peace with God through Jesus. And the crowds would one accord pay attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, well, when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. Now, look at this. Here is again the coming of this external Position. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there's much joy in that city. We held it free. It was a society that recognized spiritual forces, recognized the destruction of spiritual forces, and the kingdom of God comes sweeping in, the kingdom of darkness has moved out, and there's great joy by everybody. Notice the opposition from the gates of hell. The church has gotten the attention of the gates of hell. Now, in the process there, there was a man named Simon, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was something great. Magic is well known in the ancient world, it's well known today. Actually, even well known at the founding of our own country, uh, came together in Salem, Massachusetts. The witchcraft of Barbados found its way into Salem, Massachusetts, and Tituba, the, the maid in uh, uh, the pastor's house. In Salem, and then the Puritans brought with them white magic from Europe, and they tried to counter the black magic by baking a cake at 
sorry for the graphic nature of this, but baking a cake with dog urine in it, which was a white magic way of countering black magic. The lie to that is white magic is good and black magic is bad. I say this because this is what our grandkids are having to live with. This is common now. I deal with kids that are in covens and the occult all the time. The lie is that there's good witchcraft and bad witchcraft. The, the truth is it's all bad and you don't counter one with the other, but our Puritan forefathers brought up with them, believe it or not, and magic and sorcery is the trying to tap into power, divine power, for personal manipulation and gain, for protection or for cursing or for blessing. It um, is a tool of the kingdom of darkness. It would also be hooked to astrology, not astronomy, astrology and so on and so forth. And we'll see a lot of this when we hit Acts 19. So here this guy becomes a Christian, he recognizes the power, and it catches his attention. But notice, he thought he was somebody great. That's always the case. And that, by the way, is the lie of witchcraft, is that you are in control. Greatest deceit of all is that you find out you have been controlled all along. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called they paid attention because for a long time he was amazing them with magic. And it wasn't like, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. It had to be on par, on par with things that were inexplicable and probably demonic. I would say it had to be. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, which means they were saved and they followed the obedience of baptism. Even Simon himself believed. That's an important point here because... He's changing, but wait a second, he doesn't have the full picture. After being baptized, he continued with Philip, and after seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. When the apostles of Jerusalem, sidebar, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. Why? Wasn't Philip good enough? Why would they send Peter and John? Who were hanging out together, they always go up until they were in the temple and they healed, they healed the lame man. I argue that Peter is the key guy. He's the key guy in Jerusalem. He stands up in Acts 2 and says, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. This is uh, the coming of the Spirit of God. He's the one that they send to Samaria to pray that the Holy Spirit would come. And he's going to be the key guy in Acts 10 with Cornelius. And the Holy Spirit comes upon the Gentiles in that way. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not stand against it. That's been misinterpreted a long time. By some. What he, Jesus was talking about was that Peter was going to be the central guy in which the church is formed in three stages. The kingdom of God is being birthed here in the church in three stages. Why three stages? Well, probably because who would let the Samaritans in? And who on earth would ever let the Italians in? No way. Especially because Cornelius, the Italian regiment, that's Rome. Rome is the head of the Gentile Empire. The church, as Paul later described, is one body. It's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Jews and Gentiles together in one body. Whoa, this is amazing. I don't want those people in the club. So what does God do? He clearly forms the club in three stages among three distinct groups of people. Jews who have the covenant promises. Gentiles who are not Jews. But oh, there's this other group of people who are sort of like in between. Samaritans. So if you were living back then, you'd be Jews, or Gentiles, Samaritans, now you got everybody. So they sent Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, let me go a little further. For, they, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's so much interpretation, and I would say misinterpretation of these verses. What's prescriptive, what is descriptive, is this another baptism, and so on. And I would argue, and again, this is just, you go to the scripture yourself. The key phrase there is at the end of verse 16, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Remember, Jesus said in the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them what they are doing. We just turn that into a formula, right? I baptize in the name of the Father, Holy Spirit. Might I do my first baptism? I was a young pastor. I never learned how to do that in um, seminary. Believe it or not, I spent four years in seminary. I never learned how to do a baptism. So I went to an older pastor who knew more than I did. And I said, how do I do a baptism? Because i got a bunch of people getting baptized. 
And he showed me, and he said, now this really, be really careful, because when you put people under, make sure they hold their nose, and you bring them down, bring them up, so they don't come up coughing and spitting. And I thought that was good. So kind of like handle, remind them to hold their nose. So we didn't have a baptismal tub. We were the oldest Baptist church in the state of Maine that didn't have a baptism tub. So I went, we were the second oldest Baptist church. So I went to the oldest Baptist church with the second youngest pastor. And I said, can we do a joint baptismal service? That oh, was great. So you got a oh, well, mega church at that point. We probably had 100 people between the two congregations. And so I've got all these people lined up to do baptism. I'm nervous. I mean, you think they're nervous getting baptized? I'm nervous because they never did this before. So it gets up to me. I'm might, right? And I said, I baptize you. Here's the formula. In the name of the Father, Son. And I got to remember, hold your nose. So I'm saying, hold your nose. But it's being picked up. <laughs> so I became known throughout Southern Maine as the, the pastor that baptizes in the name of the Father, Son, and all of your nose. <laughs> I couldn't put that down for 10 years. Now the reason why that's important in the end of verse 16 is not because I got the formula wrong. We turn everything into a formula. But it highlights the fact that yes, they are saved. But no, they were lacking the other piece. Messiah, the Spirit, is kingdom. And it's God's way of showing, boom, in Jerusalem, Pentecost, stage one. Boom, Samaria, stage two. And then you'll see it again in Acts 10 with the Gentiles. And I think that's the key to it. It's not whether this is a second baptism or whatever. And it's not that this is also normative. I would argue that that phrase tells us what was going on. The Holy Spirit is necessary for the formation of the church and the coming of the kingdom. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon, and by the way, doesn't recount uh, the same things that happened in Pentecost, it's just silent at that. And when Simon saw the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours. Pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. It doesn't tell us what Simon actually did. But the next phrase in verse 23 is important. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Now, I don't know if you can read this. Deuteronomy 29, 18. I'll, I'll read it to you in case you can't see it. Um, 29, verse 18. Beware lest any among you, man, woman, or clan, or tribe, whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of the nations, these demons. Beware lest there be among you a root of bearing, poisonous, or bitter fruit. That's the call of bitterness. So what is he saying? Along with idolatry and sorcery and demon worship, springs this root of bitterness. And the fact that Peter quotes that to Simon makes me think he's linking the two together. That's important to the argument because I'm saying is you will see this growing invasion of the kingdom of darkness as the church expands. So you got a sorcerer who wants the power. He's only halfway in the kingdom. And then Peter links that to what would have been well known even to the Samaritans, would have been well known as a sign of demonism. That's the attack of the kingdom of darkness. Satan's king. Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord, and nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, it doesn't say what happened after that, because I think the most important verse is the one I just highlighted. Luke and Peter are linking it to the attack of the kingdom of darkness. Don't forget, the book of Acts is about the expansion of the kingdom of God. The book of Acts is about we, the church, being an advanced force of the kingdom ahead of time, out of phase, out of time, the kingdom that's already here but not yet come. And now you not only get opposition from the religious leaders, not only problems on the inside, but you're getting this demonic opposition. Now, when they had testified and spoke the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to many villages and Samaritans. Now, it goes on to the last part of this. Philip continues, and now he finds an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place, and he rose and he went, and there was an Ethiopian. Now, Ethiopia back then was the land of Cush. It would today be the land of Sudan. 
Uh, Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all the treasure. And he'd come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So he would be called a god fearer. He's following the God of Israel. He's reading the scriptures, but he's not Jewish. The spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and asked, do you understand what you're reading? He said, well, how can I? Unless someone guides me, and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture he was reading is this, and it's Isaiah 53. Like a sheep, he was led to slaughter. Like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. This is the suffering servant passage, the great suffering servant passage of Isaiah. Go back and read it from the first verse of 53, and you'll just say, wow, how can you not see Jesus in this? In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does this prophet say, um, say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told me good news about Jesus. Took scripture, the power of the word, to enlighten the heart. So now we've got the power of the spirit with the preaching of the gospel. Spirit writes a book, it's called the Bible, scripture. Now you have the power of the word of God, authored by the scripture, to lead to Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What ferment prevents me from being baptized? Notice there was no baptism class, by the way. Notice they didn't ask the method or the mode. I'm just saying. I had a friend that mentored me. He was um, out of the Jesus movement. He was a hippie. And he got saved, and no one ever told him how to do this right, but when he and his wife got saved and all of his pot-smoking friends in the 1960s, they just started telling people about Jesus. And as the story goes, the church wasn't too happy to let certain pot-smoking hippies who came to Jesus in. So they didn't know what to do about baptism, so they started baptizing people themselves who came to the Lord. But they had a problem. They were living in a little camper, and they didn't have a bathtub. They had a half a bathtub. So they used to do it like this, and they would sort of rock them from the head to the feet. <laughs> Does that count? Or do they need to be rebaptized later in a real tub? Don't get stuck in that argument. The point is that they are believing in Jesus, they are following in obedient faith. And so he commanded the chariot to stop. They went down the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. That's bizarre. Yeah. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. Now, what's not in the book, which I really want to know, is what did Philip think about this? How did this work? Did he just like turn around and it was a doorway? Did he see blinding light like in Star Trek? Was it a warp engine? Was it a wormhole? That's because I have a modernistic mind. I want to know the science behind it. They didn't care. He was here, he wasn't there, he was over there. That's a miracle. He popped from here to there. That's power. Maybe that's why Simon was trying to buy the same thing. He passed through and he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. In the next chapter, we'll talk about the conversion of Saul to Paul. But there's a couple of things that you need to see and to notice in all these things. Why didn't the Holy Spirit come upon the Ethiopian eunuch? He was a Gentile. I would argue it's because it was Philip not Peter, number one. Number two, it may have something to do with the fact that he was a eunuch, which wasn't allowed in the Jewish um, worship areas, but I don't think so. And the other reason why I believe is because when we hit Acts 10, and Cornelius, I keep making fun of my brother, Italians, Cornelius is a Roman, and Rome is the center of the Gentile kingdom. And you can't plant a better flag than that. The church would be birthed in Jerusalem, Samaria, and Rome. That means everybody from around the world is now open to enter the kingdom of God. I also want to highlight that, hey, Philip's a deacon. This is well beyond the standard deacon practices. Now you know why they had such character requirements on them. Because they were defending the word of God, proclaiming the word of God, advancing the kingdom of God. But I also want you to know and see that God, I believe, is purposely building the church in stages, that Peter is the key guy, because in Matthew 16, I'm going to Peter upon this rock, I will build my church. And once the church is formed in those three stages, the narrative will switch primarily to Paul and the expansion of the church. 
But as good literature goes, in between chapters 8 and 10, which is Samaritans and the Gentiles, you've got to have a conversion of this guy named Paul. And so that's what's coming next. So really up to chapter 10 is the formation of the church. After chapter 10 is going to be expansion. We are a citizen of another kingdom. We are the temple of the living God, a holy people who are called to do exactly what Philip was doing. Proclaim Jesus to our neighbors, our friends, our family. Tell about the peace we have with God. And then watch how Jesus transforms lives in bringing people into the kingdom through this really strange group of people called the church. Oh, that would be you and me. Father, we thank you for this amazing thing that you're doing around us. Uh, it's hard for us to understand how you've done all these things. But yet we realize you give us great responsibility. And so we pray that just like with Philip and the disciples that have gone before us, that we would be faithful in making disciples, proclaiming Jesus, and bearing testimony to what he's done. I pray that here throughout Sun City and Carolina Orchards that your kingdom would come, that your church would be alive and vibrant, impacting the community, and always bearing witness to Jesus. We pray that in his name. Amen. Thank you, David. Yeah, I think, uh, where's Chuck Uncle? Yeah, Chuck, Chuck asked to play this song. It was Wednesday morning. And I'm going, boy, you know, this song sounds really familiar. I think we've played it recently. But nevertheless, we're going to play it again. It is a great Thanksgiving song. Give thanks. Yeah, please. And since we're not competing with that little kid, we can uh, you know feel feel welcome to sing. Uh, you're welcome to sing along with it. That kid was kind of hard. That's yeah. That was an, an amazing song. I saw you crying.
thank you for being here. Uh, make sure you come by and say hi to Dave, and uh, and and hopefully, you know, when and you look at what God has done with His heart, as this format uh, might duplicate itself over there in in uh, Carolina or churches, as, as God works with uh, the body of believers over there. Give thanks. Thank you for being here today. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, that was a good Thanksgiving.